careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what the right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. I pray, Lord, that you would come and breathe life among us. The letter kills, Lord, but the words you give are spirit and life. Speak spirit and life into us today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. I want to uh, say thank you to Pastor Ruth, to Pastor Jason, to all of the musicians, all of the singers, to everybody who came to pray for fire in the new year on Friday evening. We started at 6 p.m. on Friday evening and went all the way through to 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. What a powerful time of worship and prayer that we had together. And I shared a word from the Lord on Friday evening that I just want to repeat for everyone's benefit. The Lord wants to encourage someone with this promise. An act of obedience is an open door for God to move miraculously in your life. An act of obedience is an open door for God to move miraculously on your behalf. I believe that this is a supernaturally charged season when God is eager to reward your simple steps of faithful obedience with mighty breakthroughs and answers to prayer. And I believe that he's especially eager to respond to your obedience in the giving of your tithe and in your offerings to phase two and to your jump in pledge. At the center of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, Jesus discusses three acts of worship, giving and fasting and praying. Those three acts of worship were central to the Jewish faith in Jesus' day, and Jesus said that they will continue to be central to our faith as his followers. Giving and praying and fasting are central to our participation in the kingdom of heaven on earth. And as I look at Jesus' words here in Matthew 6, I find four essential truths about giving that I want to share with you quickly this morning. Four essential truths about giving from Jesus. The first truth is this. Jesus assumes that my worship will include giving. He assumes that my worship will include giving. Beloved, don't overlook Jesus' stance on these three acts of worship. Jesus says when you give, when you pray, when you fast. Jesus doesn't say if, he says when. He assumes that I am going to give and pray and fast, and he assumes that I'm going to do these things on a regular basis. Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 1 are important. He calls these three things acts of righteousness. Jesus is calling us to action. He anticipates that my inner righteousness is going to express itself outwardly in these righteous acts. You know, when it comes to righteousness in the New Testament, there are two sides to the coin. Righteousness is something that I am in Christ. It is also something that I do through Christ. And it's not either or, it is both and. On one side of the coin, righteousness is to be in right standing before God. The only way that we get into right standing before God is through Jesus, through his atoning work on the cross. When we believe on Jesus, when we receive him into our heart, his blood washes away our sins and our guilt, and it puts us into right standing before God. The New Testament uses the word justified. Somebody explained it this way. Justified means it's just as if I'd never sinned. 
Paul said, when that day comes that I finally stand in the presence of God, I want to be found in possession of a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus, not a righteousness of my own striving. On the other side of the coin, righteousness is right living before God and before men. You see, right standing and right living are fused together back to back. If Jesus has put us into right standing, then it will inevitably produce right living. Right living is the natural overflow of right standing. Right standing must necessarily produce right living. That is the central message of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the righteous acts Jesus assumes I will do is to worship God with joyful giving. You know, the best picture, really, of what Jesus is trying to capture in the Sermon on the Mount that I found is the man Zacchaeus. Do you remember the wee little man who climbed up the sycamore tree? Zacchaeus loved money. He loved the stature that it gave him in the community, and he spent his entire lifetime cheating people out of money. But when Jesus called Zacchaeus' name one day, a radical transformation happened inside of his heart. A new kind of joy flooded over his soul, and his money wasn't important to him anymore. He pledged to give half of his money away to the poor, and he re pledged to repay everyone that he had cheated far beyond what the law required him. See, don't you want that kind of encounter with Jesus? Don't you want to hear him call your name in such a way that it produces a radical change deep inside? You can't change yourself. Only the indescribable work of the Holy Spirit can change your inner nature when Jesus calls your name. And Zacchaeus is the perfect picture of the inner inclination to go the extra mile that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. You see, obedience that is driven by delight looks so different than obedience that is driven by duty. Yeah. Beloved, listen to me. God isn't interested in the disingenuous quibbling of Christians so-called who are looking for ways to obey Jesus the least that they can. That is the righteousness of the Pharisees that Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. God is looking for hearts like Zacchaeus. It's more than a coincidence that the story of Zacchaeus follows close on the heels of the story of the rich young ruler who loved his money more than Jesus, and he couldn't let go of that idol to follow Jesus. Jesus says, when you give, he assumes that I will, that my worship is part of that. Four essential truths about giving from Jesus. The second truth is this. Jesus assumes that my giving will exceed the minimum requirement to tithe. Jesus assumes that my giving will exceed the minimum requirement. You doing all right this morning? Y'all got quiet on me real quick. Can I get you a little, can I get you something, a little hot cocoa, a little coffee? Can I do something for you? It's going to be all right, all right? Every, somebody look at your neighbor, tell them it's going to be all right. In Matthew 6, 2, Jesus only explicitly mentions almsgiving. Almsgiving is help for the poor. It's help for the needy. The Greek word is literally mercy giving. And some believers like to think that because Jesus only mentions almsgiving here that we're off the hook when it comes to tithing, but not so fast. You see, in the ears of Jesus' listeners, tithing was already assumed. Support of the synagogue, support of the temple, support of the priests, it was already assumed. So since tithing is already assumed in the context what Jesus addresses here is voluntary giving that is over and above the minimum. And here's the message. Jesus assumes that my inner righteousness is going to manifest in acts of joyful voluntary giving that are over and above 
the minimum requirement. He assumes I am going to tithe. He assumes that I am going to support my local church and the ministry of the gospel. And beyond that, he assumes that out of the joyful overflow of my heart, I'm going to give voluntary offerings over and above. You know, among the Jewish people, generous giving was the norm. Among pagan cultures, it was not the norm. But it has always been the norm for God's people. You remember the story of the prodigal son? When he moved away from his father, he went to a pagan country, a non-Jewish culture, and when he was in need, no one would give him anything to eat because that wasn't the norm. And then he remembered what it was like in father's house. He remembered that even the least of his father's servants had plenty to eat because generous giving was the norm there. And beloved, what Jesus is telling us is that in the culture of his kingdom, in the culture of Father's house, generous giving is the norm. It means we reflect the generous heart of our Father who has given so much to us. Yes. You know, it must seem very odd to God when Christians fuss about tithing. After all, tithing is the minimum standard God has set for our giving. God said the first one-tenth of everything you receive is holy. Offer it to the Lord. Before the law, Abraham, the father of all who live by faith, tithed. Before the law, Jacob tithed. That was part of the worship of the Old Testament even before the law was given. It's funny that any of Jesus' followers should fuss over that. Even the Pharisees, who loved money almost as much as they loved attention, tithed. In Matthew 6, 2, it tells us they even gave over and above offerings. Some believers think that tithing is not in the New Testament. Beloved, let me tell you, not only is tithing in the New Testament, it's affirmed by Jesus himself. You can't go any higher than that. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you tithe meticulously on your garden herbs, even on your mint and your anise and your cumin. And he said, you should do this, but don't neglect the weightier matters of the law. Tithing is something God expects we'll do, and it's the minimum God expects we'll do. I wonder how it makes God feel when he lavished his very best on us in Jesus, and we kick against giving him the minimum. We were looking at some baby pictures the other day. My, t my twins just turned 12 two weeks ago, and so we were looking through old photos, and I remembered a game I used to play with my daughter Maddie in her high chair. I used to pour a little handful of goldfish on her tray, the Pepperidge Farm kind, not the flopping around kind. <laughs> and then I would ask Maddie to share a goldfish with me. And she would hold one up in the air, and I would kind of come down, and just as I was about to chomp it, she would yank it away from me, and she'd pop it in her mouth, and she would laugh and laugh and laugh. And you know, it was just a fun little game that we used to play, but seriously, you know, she didn't want to share her goldfish. <laughs> she didn't realize that I was the guy who went to work and earned the paycheck to buy the goldfish. Since we had twins, I used to do a lot of the shopping back in those days. She didn't realize that I was the guy who went to stop and shop and put the goldfish in the buggy and brought them home. She didn't realize that I was the guy who reached up in the cupboard and poured the goldfish on her tray. She didn't realize that if I wanted to, I could have poured out the entire bag. In fact, I could have put her in the bathtub. I could have filled the whole thing with goldfish. She also didn't realize that I really didn't need her to share with me because I was holding the bag. I just wanted to see if she would. All she knew is that those were her goldfish and she wasn't giving one of them to daddy. Beloved, can I tell you, sometimes we play the same game with God. The Bible says, remember the Lord your God, he is the one who gives you the ability to get wealth and so confirms his covenant. Listen, you may be clever, but you ought to thank God that he made you clever. 
Nebuchadnezzar thought he was something special and God sent him on a little romp through the pasture for a few years to remind him who made him so smart and capable. You might work hard, but God is the one who has given you the capacity to work hard, the ability to work hard, the opportunity. Let me tell you something. Even before you knew him, every open door and opportunity you had in his life, in your life was because of him. He's the one who provided for your parents to provide for you. He's the one who provided for your education. He's the one who provided the open door in your professional life. Even before you knew God's hand was over you and watching you and guiding you, he was doing all of that for such a time as this. And beloved, whether you have a big pile of goldfish on your tray or just a small pile of goldfish, all of your goldfish have come from God. He has the ability to submerge you in goldfish. And he doesn't really need you to share your goldfish with him. He's holding the bag. But he wants to see if you will. He wants to see if you have the same kind of giving heart that he has. Will you fuss about sharing with him, really? Jesus assumes your worship will include giving. He assumes that you will tithe, that you will give voluntary offerings, that you will support your local church and its ministers, that you will support the spread of the gospel, the advance of his kingdom, that you will help the poor and the needy. Here at Harvest Time, our giving falls into four different categories. Your tithe goes to our general fund to pay for the operating expenses of our church. It goes to pay our mortgages, which are about $24,000 a month goes to pay our maintenance and our utilities. Our electric bill is $10,000 a month. We have a 5,000-gallon oil tank underneath the ground. It goes to pay our pastor's salary. It goes to pay for our Stanford Satellite Campus. It pays for Sunday school curriculum and youth activities and adult discipleship materials and musical instruments. It pays for goldfish for the kinder church. It takes about $180,000 a month to run Harvest Time Church. Can you imagine? That's a lot of money, y'all. <laughs> Your building fund givings being saved up for the start of phase two. On January 2nd, we received great word. After five months, uh, we had applied in August to move our documents, our construction documents forward for a building permit, and they were hung up over an issue in planning and zoning for five months. And we were praying about it. We had several meetings. And on January 2nd, we received a great, great word from our attorney that they've moved forward from planning and zoning. And they're on their way to the building department now. We're trusting God's going to help us get that permit in our hand by this summer so that we can break ground. We need to have $2.5 million cash in hand to start the building by this summer. And so we want to thank you for your giving to our building fund. Your benevolence giving goes to help needy people within the orbit of our congregation. And in addition to what you give designated for benevolence, we use money from our general fund to help people in need when we can. And your missions giving goes to help spread the gospel here at home and all around the world. We have our missions convention coming up uh, February 7th, 8th, 9th, and once again, we're gonna ask you to make a one-year pledge for over and above giving to the work of missions. You know, it's really an amazing thing. Wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't seen it happen in front of my own eyes, but over the last 15 years, every time we've been raising money to buy more land or build a building or pop up an air dome or expand our parking lots, do you know every time that we've been raising money for some kind of project, our missions giving has gone up because generosity breeds generosity. And because as you give, God keeps increasing your capacity and your ability to give. This is one of the most generous congregations that I have ever had the privilege of serving in the kingdom of God. And I think you ought to give yourselves a big hand today because you've been so generous and given. You deserve a better hand than that. Come on. Four essential truths about giving. Jesus assumes my worship will include giving. He assumes my giving will exceed the minimum requirement. Number three, Jesus alerts me that my giving must flow from pure heart motives. He alerts me that my giving must flow from pure heart motives. The very first word of Matthew 6 is a word of warning, beware. Jesus said, beware. 
that you don't do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. Jesus assumes that we will give generously, but the act of giving is not enough in itself. Jesus said, when we give, we must give with pure motives. The Pharisees were giving, but their motives for giving were impure. One impure motive that I see in them is the motive of self-promotion. In Jesus' day, there were corporate prayer times two times a day every day. One of the corporate prayer times was early in the morning, and so most people observe that in private at home. But the big corporate prayer time was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in the temple. That was the time of the evening sacrifice. Peter and John and the other apostles observed this prayer time every day. They went up to the temple every day for the 3 o'clock time of prayer, and people lined up in the streets so as they passed by, the radial anointing that emanated off of them would cause healings. I want that kind of radial anointing. I walk down the aisle and see people healed by the power of Jesus. And just before 3 o'clock in the afternoon, trumpets would sound from the temple calling people to come and pray. And at the same time, people would bring their offerings for the poor. Often they would carry their offerings in their hands so that everyone could see it. And people who couldn't make it all the way up to the temple would stop in the streets wherever they were and they would turn and face the temple to pray and they would give their offerings right there on the street. That's why the lame man in the book of Acts strategically positioned himself outside the gate called Beautiful. He was at a strategic place at a strategic time. And the Pharisees loved to position themselves strategically too, either in the temple or on a busy street corner so that lots of people could see them praying and giving their offerings to the poor. That's why Jesus says here, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. Jesus said one impure motive for giving is self-promotion, to be admired by others, to earn respect, to earn a good uh, reputation, (laughs) to earn appointments to positions of influence. Beloved, that is the culture of some ministries in some churches, but I want to tell you that is not the culture here at Harvest Time. And the reason why is because we practice anonymous giving here at Harvest Time. What that means is I don't know what anybody gives to our church ever. I know the total number of pledges that have come in for jump in, but I don't know what any of you have pledged other than what my wife and I pledged. Our board doesn't know what any individual gives either. The only people who know what each individual gives is Chicky Scopoletti, our bookkeeper, and Phil Bernstein, our Jewish accountant, and they're not talking. (laughs) We practice anonymous giving for a few reasons. It was the practice of Pastor Tate, our founding pastor. It was the practice of my spiritual father in Philadelphia at my home church. Your giving is sacred between you and the Lord. I don't want to relate on, to any of you on the basis of what you do or what you don't give. When I look at you, I don't see dollar signs. I see sons and daughters of God. Amen. But there is a downside to anonymous giving. The downside is that your extraordinary sacrifices go unthanked personally by me. And I wish you knew the gratitude in my heart. I've actually had friends tell me, Glenn, you'll never build phase two if you keep with this anonymous stuff and you don't thank the people that write big checks. There is a downside to anonymous giving, but the upside outweighs the downside. The downside is you don't get thanked by me, but the upside of that is you're in perfect position to be thanked by your Father in heaven. And how many of you know that his, his thank you is much better than my thank you? Because he's holding the bag of goldfish. A second impure motive for giving can be self-satisfaction or self-congratulation. Jesus uses the word hypocrites to describe people who give with impure motives. Hypocrite is a Greek word which means an actor. So a hypocrite pretends to be one thing, but he's really another. And in the Gospel of Matthew, the really scary nuance is that even more than deceiving others, a hypocrite is self-deceived. They don't see themselves. 
And when it comes to giving, some people are self-deceived. Their motive for giving is to feel better for themselves. They give to unburden themselves of some kind of moral burden. They give to assuage their guilt sometimes over their own success. They give in an attempt to make up for other wrongs that they have done. Beloved, listen to me. If you're disobedient over here in some area of your life, if you're living and walking in disobedience, you cannot make up for it by doing something good over here. As if the good thing you're doing over here will cancel out the bad thing you're doing over there. That is not the way it works in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus always wants your one thing, and he'll keep pursuing you till he has it. Jesus' words in Matthew 6, won't allow us to give for self-gratification. He said, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Jesus says, take care that you don't give so that you're congratulated by men. And he says, don't congratulate yourself either. Don't toot your horn in public and don't pat yourself on the back in private. And that's good preaching. Another impure motivation for giving can be financial gain. Beloved, there are wonderful promises in the Word of God connected to our giving. There are wonderful promises connected to tithing. There are wonderful promises connected to specifically giving to build God a house of worship. There are wonderful promises connected to giving to spread the gospel. There are wonderful promises connected to giving to help the poor. God says it is a loan that He Himself will repay to you. Jesus made wonderful promises connected to giving. He said, give and it shall be given back to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God will cause men to pour into your lap. If your boss has promoted you, if he gave you a bonus, if he gave you an increase, if you've advanced, I want to tell you that is God causing men to pour into your lap. I commend tithing to you without apology, without excuse, because I absolutely believe that it is God's pathway to blessing in our life. But I want to tell you that's never supposed to be our motivation for giving. Some people treat giving like a spiritual slot machine. They're playing to see how big of a jackpot will come back, but that's not the heart that God is looking for in giving. Why is it after we've been married for 10 or 15 or 20 years, we start buying practical gifts for each other? You know what I'm talking about? You should ask Pastor Tate about the year he bought snow tires for Patty for Christmas. <laughs> he, he thought it was a loving gift, you know, that expressed his concern for her safety. Turns out January was a lot icier than he imagined it was going to be. You know, sometimes we, we buy gifts that are more for us than are for the recipient. A few years ago, Ben and I went out shopping together for Mother's Day, and we came back with the complete Star Wars saga on DVD. It was my son's idea. And I can't begin to describe the delight to you on Father's Day when I opened up the complete Anne of Green Gables saga on DVD. But maybe, guys, you remember when you're first dating your wife and you were so in love and you remember when that first birthday or Christmas rolled around and you remember how much thought you put into the gift. You remember the trouble that you went to, the sacrifice that was involved. I went all the way from Springfield, Missouri to Chicago to get something that I thought would please my wife. And that was the goal. Just to, to give her something that expressed your love, that expressed how deeply you felt. Her delight in opening it was all the thanks that you needed. That is the heart that God is looking for in our giving. Yes. Let me ask you a question. What if God gave you nothing else in return for your giving, would you still give to him? What if he didn't open up the windows of heaven like he promised? What if he didn't bless the work of your hands with a good return like he promised? What if he didn't make all grace abound to you like he promised? What if he didn't repay what you loaned to the poor like he promised? Would you still give anyway? What if your only reward was the knowledge that your giving had honored him? 
that your giving had delighted his heart? What if the only reward was the knowledge that you helped further the work of his kingdom on earth, what he cares about most? See, if God never did another thing for me, he has done so much for me already. He saved me. When I was a lost, lonely little boy, Jesus came into my heart. And if God never did anything else for me, that alone would be enough. I could never repay my gratitude. What if giving cost you more than it does now? Would you still give? You know, something that's on the table, uh, really on the table right now, is removing the deduction that you get on your taxes for giving to your church. In fact, I'll tell you, the long-term agenda of the gay rights movement is to remove the tax-exempt status from any churches who deny people their civil rights to gay marriage. That is what they are pushing for and going for possible that in the coming years Christians could lose that tax deduction for giving would you still give if it cost you more than it does now Jesus assumes we'll give but he alerts that our motives must be pure and pure motive is to honor him to delight him to express my love and gratitude to express my faith that the same God who put goldfish on my tray today will put goldfish on my tray tomorrow and the next week and the next week that he'll provide what my kids need. He's going to help with braces and with college tuition and with weddings for my daughters and with retirement. He's going to bless my kids and their kids. If Jesus tarries to a thousand generations, the blessing of God is going to be on my family. When I give, I'm expressing faith in that great God. It's the way the kingdom of heaven operates. I have been forgiven, so I forgive. I have received mercy, so I am merciful. I have received freely, so I give freely. Four essential truths. Uh, this is good preaching right here. I'm about to preach myself happy right now. Four essential truths about giving from Jesus. The final truth is this. Worship team, come help me. Final truth. Jesus assures me that by giving... I am participating in the economy of heaven. He assures me that by giving, I am participating in the economy of heaven. If you don't like how things are working out for you right now under the U.S. economy, take my advice, just move out from underneath it. You do have that choice. A while back ago, I was watching an interview between Baba Wawa and Rush Limbaugh. And Barbara Walters asked Rush his opinion of the recession. And Rush answered, recession? And Barbara Walters was shocked. She said, surely you know that there's a recession going on right now. And Rush Limbaugh said, oh, I know that there's a recession going on. I just choose not to participate in it. Beloved, can I tell you, you do have a choice not to participate in this recession. You can choose to participate in the economy of heaven instead. Jesus said when you worship God through giving, you are participating in the economy of heaven. Heaven's economy is eternally stable. Heaven's economy is eternally growing. It only expands. It never contracts. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Before the law. Abraham, the father of all those who lived by faith, tithed. And when he tithed, he participated in the economy of heaven. The good land that Lot chose became a salt sea. And the bad land that Abraham was inherited with became a land flowing with milk and honey because of the righteousness of Abraham. Isaac participated in the economy of heaven when he trusted the word of God and he sowed seed during a time of severe drought. The Bible says in that same year, that seed produced for him a 100-fold return. Before the law, Jacob tithed. 
and he participated in the economy of heaven. Although Uncle Laban renegotiated Jacob's contract 10 times, he cut his wages 10 times over 20 years. Jacob left Uncle Laban's house a prosperous, wealthy man, more wealthy than Uncle Laban, because as a young man on the way there, he had an encounter with God at a place called Bethel, and he told God, if you will bring me safely home again, if you'll lead me and guide me, if you'll watch over me, if you'll bring me back to my father's house, then I will give you a tenth of everything that I have. Joseph participated in the economy of heaven. God blessed Potiphar's house for Joseph's sake. Look at me. God's going to bless your company for your sake. He's going to bless your department. He's going to bless your division for your sake. God's going to cause sales to increase. They're going to say, what's going on over there in that department? Nobody's even going to know. It's because you're there, Joseph. He participated in the economy of heaven when he became in charge of the food supply for the entire Middle East. The children of Israel participated in the economy of heaven when they left Egypt with all the gold and treasure. You know, that was back due wages for paying the pyramids. God made the Egyptians pay up adjusted for inflation and with interest on top. They participated in the economy of heaven when they ate bread that they didn't have to work for, when they drank water that they didn't have to dig for, when their shoes and their clothes never wore out. They participated in the economy of heaven when they enjoyed free air conditioning by day and free heat and light at night. How many of you like to have a little free air conditioning in the summer and a little free heat and light in the winter? Elijah participated in the economy of heaven when ravens delivered him meals on wings every morning and every evening, the widow of Zarephath participated in the economy of heaven when she offered her last cup of flour to the man of God. Jesus participated in the economy of heaven. Jesus never carried any money on him. You study it. Jesus didn't need to because he had the authority to requisition whatever he needed, whenever he needed it. And Paul said that he would give generously. God would give us that same ability. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so you always have everything you need to abound to every good work. In the economy of heaven, seven bread rolls are enough to feed 4,000 men with seven baskets left over and just five bread rolls are enough to feed 5,000 men with 12 baskets left over. And the economy of heaven, it is not the size of your opening balance that matters. It is the size of the God who is blessing you. I'll close with this. Pastor Melanie has... So many great stories of God's breakthrough and God's provision for our Spanish congregation. But one stands out. You know, uh, our Spanish church planted uh, a satellite campus in Norwalk that is going great guns. They are just absolutely packed to the gills. Uh, and I found out recently, I didn't even know, but they have opened three churches and three Harvest Time churches in South America. Uh, I, Harvest Time church is popping up all over the place. I didn't even know about it. And she had committed $10,000 to help build a Harvest Time church in her home country of Bolivia. She was set to leave on a weekday, and she didn't have the money. She had committed to bring it with her for the construction of the church, but she didn't have it, and she didn't have anywhere to get it. And she was invited to go preach at a small Spanish congregation up the line, up 95 a little ways. The crowd was small and they don't have the economy of other congregations. But the Lord told her on her way that the $10,000 she needed was in the house. Before she got up to preach, the pastor announced uh, the need for the church building and just said, whatever comes in the offering, uh, we're going to double it towards that need. So Pastor Melanie preached her heart out like she always does. And they received the offering at the end of the service and the ushers took it to a back room to count the offering and the pastor asked Melanie to just continue preaching while they counted the offering. And it was just cash, it was chenguidich, it was fives and tens, it was ones folded up into little origami. Why do you all do that? Why do you fold your, 
Why do you all fold your money up into little origamis? Don't, don't, don't fold your money up. You, you know, it takes like the girls in the office like half the day Monday to like unfold your origami. Just, you know, just fold it once. Just put it, put it in there. Come on, you're all laughing because you know you do it. Why? Why do you do it? So Melanie's preaching away and the ushers come back and they whisper in the pastor's ear that the offering was $2,000. That's a lot of money for the small handful of people that happened to be there. And the pastor didn't believe it because he had committed to give double. So he told the ushers to go back and count it again. And he signaled Melanie to keep preaching. She had no idea what was going on. Now listen to me. The offering was in a locked room in the back. They didn't pass the plate again. They didn't make an appeal for more money. Nobody, as far as they saw, contributed more to that offering. But the ushers went out and they counted the offering again. And when they came back, they whispered in the pastor's ear, the offering is $3,000. So the pastor signaled to Melanie to keep preaching and he said, go count it again. Now, now she's going through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, you know, She's on her way through to Moses, and they go count it again. They came back. He sent them one final time. She's on her way up to Gideon, David now. And finally, they came back, and they said, Pastor, the offering is $5,000. He said, Stop counting. Don't count it anymore. And God provided that need. Beloved, everybody look at me. It is not about the money. It is God doesn't need my money. He doesn't need your money. He said, all the gold is mine. All the silver is mine. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the hills. God is able to release to you whatever it is that you need, be it finances, be it healing, be it an open door, be it favor with the court system. I'm speaking prophetically now. God is able to release it to you. I want to tell you all the money for phase two and to pay off our mortgages on phase one. It is already stored up in heaven and it has Harvest Time Church written over it. If God withholds it for a little while, it's because of the process that he wants to bring us through. It's because he wants to grow faith inside of us. Somebody listen to me. Faith is not what grows when your answer comes. Faith is what grows inside of you while you're waiting on God to deliver and to answer your prayer. It's not about the money. It's about the process that God wants to bring us through as individuals and that God wants to bring us through corporately as a congregation to build up our faith and believe him. Guess what? I got news for you. After phase two is built, we're going to do serious damage to the enemy's kingdom here in Connecticut and in New York City and all around the world. And God is building our faith for greater things. Buildings are bad, you know, buildings are buildings. So what is cited, what's exciting is the kingdom work that's going to go out of that place. And this process is about growing our faith for that moment. Four truths about giving. Jesus assumes my worship will include giving. He assumes I'm going to do more than the minimum. He alerts me that my heart motives have to be pure and he assures me that when I give, I'm participating in the economy of heaven. Get on your feet. Give Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place. Come on, would you do it? He deserves a bigger praise than that. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, my heart will sing. Lift up your voice. until the end of the service to receive our giving today. I know most of us prepare our checks in advance of coming and we've prepared our tithe, our offerings to the Lord. But I save the offering to the end because I want us to really think about what it is that we're doing today. Sometimes, you know, we just fall into the routine and we, we forget why we're doing what we do. We're going to bring an offering today as an act of worship. We're going to bring an offering today as an act of righteousness. Out of sheer gratitude for everything God has done for us. To delight our Father. 
You remember the first time you got old enough to actually like treat your dad or your mom to a meal out and it felt so good to pick up the tab and to just bless them and say thank you mom and dad for we're going to bring with that kind of heart. But first and most importantly, we're going to give ourselves to Jesus. Come on, I want every person in this church to have that moment that Zacchaeus had where they hear Jesus calling their name and it releases inside of them a radical heart transformation. Obedience out of delight looks so different than obedience out of duty. It's not a burden. It's not something we have to do. It's something we get to do because we love him so much. Come on, would you lift up your face to heaven and would you just give yourself to Jesus right now? Come on, just offer all of yourself to him. Just, just say, Jesus, I'm yours. Take me, I'm yours. Come on, everything I am, everything I have, all my aspirations, all my talents, my family, my relationships, Lord, even my assets, my work, Lord, every part of my life. Come on, just, just offer it up to him. Just say, Jesus, you're my king, you're my Lord, you're my master. Lord, I just give everything I have to you. Come on, would you just thank him? He's the one who put the goldfish on your tray. Come on, think about it. I woke up the other morning and I don't know what was going on, but my heart was just so overflowing. I, I was just so filled with gratitude to God. Thank you for life. Thank you for breath. Thank you, God, for a home and a family. Thank you, Lord, for providing for me. You know what? I never missed a meal because I had to. Come on, would you just thank him and love on him right now? Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask the ushers to come and to bring some baskets and I want to just ask you as our final act of worship today to bring your offering. And then I want to ask you, if you would, just for a minute to go back to your seat because we're going to pray a prayer together and then I have an announcement that I need to make for you before we close out the service. Come put those right down in the front if you would, please, brothers. But I want to ask you, spread those out just a little bit if you would for me. Freddie, if you could, just, could you just spread those a little further? Yeah, thank you. That'll give more room for people to come. I'm going to ask you to bring your offering just as an act of worship and an act of righteousness. And then if you just return to your seat, uh, we want to say a word of prayer, and then I have something to share with you, uh, an announcement, and then we're going to go. Worship team's going to lead us while you come. Come on, let's give to the Lord. And, oh, how and would you just stretch out your hands right here towards these baskets? And come on, let's bless these gifts. These are holy. These are sacred to the Lord. Father, we've brought gifts today as an act of worship. We've brought gifts today as an act of righteousness. Lord, not as a debt we owe, but Lord, as a seed of love and faith that we sow. Father, we brought gifts to delight your heart. We've brought gifts to express our gratitude for you. Lord, we've brought gifts, Lord, in faith, thankful that you provided a uh, goldfish on our tray yesterday, Lord, and trusting that you're going to provide goldfish on our tray tomorrow and the next week and the next week, Lord, that you're going to provide for all the needs of our family, our children, Lord, our grandchildren, Lord, that the blessing of God is going to be on our house. Father, I pray that you'd bless these gifts. I pray that you'd cause them to multiply supernaturally to meet the needs, Lord, not only of this house, but of our missionaries that are working all around the world. Father, I pray that 2,000 would become 3,000, that 3,000 would become 4,000, that 4,000 would become 5,000, and that 5,000 would become 10,000. Father, I pray that phase two would be built, Lord, paid in full. Father, I pray, Lord, that these seeds, Lord, of faith would be participating in the economy of heaven. God, I pray for open doors over your people. I pray for jobs for everyone who needs a job. I pray for better jobs for everyone who needs a better job. God, I pray the wisdom of Joseph in Egypt and the wisdom of Daniel in Babylon would rest upon your people. God, that you would bless Potiphar's house for Joseph's sake, Lord that, Father, you would cause, Lord, your people to excel, Lord, in wisdom and excellence ten times above all the magicians of Babylon. I pray, Lord, that your people would be the most valuable employee in their company. Lord, they would be the most va valuable employee in their department. Lord, pray that they would be highly valued, treasured. Pray that men of noble character would notice them, Lord, and make room for them. Lord, create positions just to keep them, Lord, and keep advancing them forward. 
Lord, Father, in their work. God, I pray, Lord, that amazing, unbelievable things would happen, Lord. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd cause the things that we have to last and last beyond, long beyond their lifetime. Lord, I pray that you would just cause, Lord, our clothes and our shoes, Lord, not to wear out. Lord, I pray, Father, that you'd give us air conditioning and heat and lights, Lord. Father, I just pray, Lord, that through this whole process, you would grow us in faith and in trust in you. We give these gifts today as an act of our worship, an expression of our love. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. Stay standing if you would. And I'm going to